Um, our next speaker is uh, a doctor that uh, we're grateful has not yet uh, embarked on a career in video games. Joseph Penninger uh, inspired us all last year. Is that you, Joseph? Right. Oh, what a cool shirt. <laughs> How are you? He inspired us all last year. In fact, he dazzled us last year with the prospect of life extended. Uh, he told us a little bit about how he came to uncover the master gene for osteoporosis and to identify one of the immune system's master switches, a mechanism that can be manipulated to regulate the life and death of cells. Uh, to me, to my layman's ears, that sounded a lot like a cure for dying somehow, Joseph. <laughs> so, can you pick up the story? Sure. All right, Joseph Penninger, Canada's <laughs> superstar researcher. So, so it's nice to be back. I, I have to say my, my socialization to do science was very different. So I grew up where they made this movie, The Sound of Music, <coughs> so we, so, but I, I think you're happy that I'm not singing today. <coughs> and I went to the special school so I could still cite to you the, the whole Odyssey of Homer and Greek, <coughs> but we had basically one hour in whole my high school to do biology. So for some strange reason, I became a biologist. <coughs> and, and, and so, so I want to tell you some of the things we're doing and, and as I go along the way, I will give you some comments, also some comments why I'm actually leaving Canada again. <clears throat> so, so this was my first attempt at, at cloning. <clears throat> <laughs> I think it worked out pretty well. <clears throat> so I still believe that it's the best way to do it. And <clears throat> <laughs> so that's Gabriel, my little kid. <clears throat> so what I want to tell you about, so you have heard today, we, we know our genes, we know the genes of different organisms, but why is it, why is it that the mouse has 95% the same genes that we have, but it looks like a mouse, and Gabriel has this beautiful face and this beautiful eyes, and what, what determines what we become, and, and what are the genetic makeup, and how can we actually sort through all of this. <coughs> so this is my favorite cartoon. <coughs> and this is Albert Einstein contemplates a calm, because <coughs> he has no idea what, what's the use of this. And this basically, I think, what the genome is. It's our calm in life, <coughs> which we have no idea what we're doing. And, and <coughs> so what we really have to figure out is what all these genes are doing, what this book of life we have not we are not understanding whatsoever how we can actually figure it out, how we can read it. And I'm actually thinking life is very simple and things which are working in flies and, and worms and yeast also working in humans. And so this is what we want to uncover. And I do not believe the things should be difficult. Normally they don't work if they are. So what we are up to, we want to make a genetic map of the world. <coughs> so like explorers 500 years ago who who went with the ships to explore America or, or Australia. So we want to now make a, a shape which comes with the genes to give these genes a valley and, and, and some rivers and find out what they're really doing and, and set out things. <coughs> and how we are doing this is we use mouse genetics. So I brought one of my mice. <coughs> And so we, we connect basically with modern technology, with modern molecular biology and genetics. What we're doing, we can punch out the single gene in this mouse. So we can say we are punching out now the gene number 15,212 and generate the organism which is lacking one gene. And then we ask the question, how important is this gene now for our lives? Do these animals get heart disease? Do these animals get uh, cancer? So what's the essence of, of these genes in the whole organism and to really look what, what's working. <clears throat> and, and I was wondering for a long time, so if interested, why I'm actually turned out to, to become a mouse geneticist. And, 
And maybe one of the reasons is because I was scared to death of mice. <coughs> so when I grew up, I, I was just terrified of them. So I actually walking on the street, I would look over my shoulder because <coughs> there could be a mouse following me. <laughs> <coughs> And, and, and another story I have when I was at university. So I, I came home one night so from partying at one in the morning, and I just thought there was a mouse in my room. <coughs> and sure enough, five minutes later, there was a mouse in my room, so I, I was living in this place with five other guys. And so there was this mouse, and the mouse, of course, happened to stand in front of the door, and I was so terrified so that they jumped on the table in my room and for five hours, the mouse at the door and myself on top of the table we had this, we had this standoff. <coughs> and <laughs> we were looking at each other. We, we, anyway, the mouse gave up and, and walked away. <coughs> so, so I got lucky. Um, but one of the genes and one of the updates I will tell you fast is the gene we had found. It's called osteoprotegerin ligand and short OPG ligand, and we made a genetic map of bone loss. And to mutate the gene in this little guy, so the one below is actually when we make a mouse which doesn't have OPG ligand, osteoprotegerin ligand, the mouse above is its brother, so it's tiny. And the reason why it's tiny is these guys have completely solid bones. So it turns out osteoprotegerin ligand is actually the osteoporosis gene and without osteoprotegerin ligand, there cannot be a cell made which eats the bone away. And the net effect is a mouse where every single bone in the body of this mouse is completely solid. And then with work, a friend of mine, Bill Boyd in Los Angeles, he found the equivalent, a second gene. And actually, he called it osteoprotegerin. And as you can see here, these guys are breaking the bones all over the place, and, and osteoprotegerin is counteracting the function of OPG ligand, meaning how our bones are set up is OPG ligand is telling our bone cells to eat the bone, and OPG is shutting it down. And indeed, it turns out that OPG works like insulin for diabetics. So every time there's bone loss, all you need to do is put back osteoprotegerin, and you completely shut down bone loss. And so, <coughs> and so we hit. Um, the osteoporosis genes, and, and, and now actually OPG is in clinical, phase two clinical trial for osteoporosis. Uh, the phase one looks really promising, so a single injection of this molecule shut down bone loss for 100 days by 80%. So if that's real and then no side effects, so probably in the next generation of women doesn't know there was a disease like this. Uh, we can shut down pain and cancer metastasis, so 80% of women with breast cancer get severe pain. Uh, we could shut down, and many people can uh, shut down crippling and arthritis, which is associated with bone loss. Uh, we, we published recently we can shut down tooth loss, so not just the maple leaves are losing their teeth, so, <coughs> so also some of us, because of periodontal disease, when people grow older, it's just part of our normal physiology. And, uh, HIV-infected people losing bones, so we can really shut this down with this molecule. And actually, it's, it's quite interesting. I think two space flights ago, our protein, OPG, went to space. Because what nobody ever tells you in, this, uh, in, in Star Trek is, if these guys actually stay up there for one year, two years, they wouldn't be able to walk anymore. Because after five, six months of, of um, space flight, 10, 15% of the bone mass of the astronauts is just missing, and they do not gain it back anymore. So, so actually, people in Star Trek they would have no bones left anymore. As soon as they go somewhere, <laughs> they, they couldn't do anything. So, so this is what we're up to. And then something weird happened. <clears throat> so we labored along in our little laboratory, and then the newspapers picked up our work. So nice work. and. We got headlines all over the place, and it, it was quite neat. You know, here you are, this little researcher. Everybody's interested in you. Uh, I am here at this stage talking to you, certainly because of this. And then also some weird things happen. <coughs> so you also get the, the other thing. So, so the police came to my house, said there are people out there who want to attack your children because of what they're doing to poor animals. 
So we actually had to move our house. Uh, I was worried going shopping that somebody would come and attack my two-year-old kid <coughs> because of what I'm doing, changing genes and, and little animals. And then it even got worse. Uh, people got really pissed off with us be, because they thought we, we just did too well for whatever reason. So people tried to shut down the laboratory. Uh, there were attempts to spread things about us which were completely untrue. So until I finally had enough and decided to leave Canada, because we just couldn't do our work anymore. Because all we are responsible of doing is we want to do good research and this is our responsibility and not to worry about politics if somebody is worried about for whatever reasons. And, and basically in the good part of it, I'm, I'm moving back to Europe to establish my utopia of a research institute. And, and what I learned the last year is basically what you do not do to people, to, to, which is not very healthy for research. And I tell you some more things we're doing because we want to figure out how these little guys are working. So we worked on a gene and it's appropriate. We call it the dream gene. And the dream gene turned out controls pain perception. And that's actually our dream mouse. So it's a really pretty little mouse. It's completely healthy. So they're completely normal. They have normal behaviors. However, they have much less pain. They have much less pain, acute pain, they have much less belly pain, they have much less chronic pain, back pain. So 20% of people have chronic pain. There are hardly any things which are working to protect from pain perception. And also pain is an essential sense, so like seeing things, like, like touching things. You actually have to be able to perceive pain. So especially in Canada, you need to know you're going out into the cold. So if you don't know this, you're in big trouble. And what Dream is actually doing is, so what Dream is doing is if you cut yourself, you need to detect you hurt yourself or if you touch something. And then your signal of pain perception goes into your spinal cord. And then it goes in your brain and you say, oh my god, I cut myself. This is hurting, so I have to do something. To, to counteract this. And Dream is sitting in our spinal cord and what Dream is doing, it allows us to perceive pain. <clears throat> so it basically allows us that we can feel pain. However, when the pain comes, Dream drops off where it's doing and basically makes these animals like, like long distance runners. So they're swimming in their own opioids now. And so pain perception shuts down. So DREAM is a very simple feedback mechanism which allows you to feel pain. As soon as pain comes, DREAM drops off. You make your own endogenous opioids which shut down pain perception. And after three, four minutes of pain, you don't feel it anymore. So this was quite neat. And so we came up with this scheme. <clears throat> if you have no DREAM, you have no pain. <clears throat> so, so we are trying now to, to basically target DREAM in the spinal cord for treatment for, for chronic back pain, for, for cancer patients, for, for many people who have pain. Another thing we got interested in is heart diseases. <clears throat> so as Christoph already mentioned, these are very complex diseases. How can we tickle heart disease? And so to basically also find the genes in these little guys. And we found a gene called ACE2. <clears throat> and, and actually we went back even to a more primitive organism. So this is a fly eye. So we actually flies have hearts. And this is how the hearts look in the flies. So these little dots actually become the fly heart. And so we went back to flies and so, so what controls heart function and heart development in little flies. And if this is essential for heart development, then we can just take it right into our animals and look what it's doing. And so we came across this gene called ACE2. And sure enough, when we mutate the gene ACE2 in these little guys here, when you, this is actually this little spike here is a single heartbeat, so we can actually do echocardiography and ECGs in these little animals and these little mice, so yeah, which is quite neat. So this little, every peak is a little heartbeat, so the top one is completely normal. The one in the middle, when we mutate the ACE2 gene, the hearts are failing. So ACE2 controls heart failure which was really neat because we finally had found a gene which controls heart function, the pumping function of the heart and heart failure. 
and indeed our mice resemble humans with coronary heart disease. So we actually have a mouse model now to study complex diseases and heart failure. And we found a second gene, which is on the bottom. If we mutate this one, then the hearts are completely normal again. So ACE2 actually protects us from heart failure. And if you mutate ACE2, every single animal which has a loss of ACE2 goes into heart failure. So normally in hearts, what happens if somebody has hypertension or there's a heart attack, the normal heart has a compensatory mechanism, which is it becomes larger. So it's called cardiac hypertrophy. So the hearts are larger, and the reason is if you have hypertension, you need to pump a lot now. So you can overcome this, this problem you're having. However, if you squeeze the system too much, what's happened is people go into heart failure, and from the World Health Organization, it's estimated that in, in 15 years, uh, heart failure will be the major killer on this planet, uh, much more than and cancer and uh, infectious diseases. <coughs> also in third world countries, uh, for example, in Brazil, they have the putting a lots of money in heart diseases because also these countries are now the people getting older, the, the dynamics and epidemiology of diseases are changing rapidly. So we looked at the gene called P10 to map out what determines heart size. And sure enough, <coughs> the left one is a normal one, or the left one, yeah? <coughs> and the right one is if you mutate P10 and you just can make these hearts just blow up. They're huge hearts. But what's really intriguing is the hearts are huge, but they work completely normal. You can do the same in flies, and it's really neat. You can actually mutate the P10 gene only in the head or in the wings of the fly. And what happens is you get the completely normal fly where the head is twice as large or where the head is only half as large. So you can actually play around with genetics to change the size of an organism without changing the function of these organisms whatsoever. And so this was the scheme. So we have actually these genes which control heart size, and this is actually work we did for the last five years. So, so this is just uh, the summary of it. It turns out insulin, which controls our glucose metabolism, is actually a critical regulator of heart size. If you don't have insulin, the, our hearts are actually half size for the hearts of these little guys. And, and we can also uncouple heart size and heart function. The real reason why we are doing this is because we want to find genes. When somebody goes in heart failure, we want to find genes which are still protecting the hearts from, from the pumping function. So somebody has failure, but we can selectively switch them on so people can live for another 10 years without needing heart transplants. And so this brings me really to the end of my, my talk here. And, and what I wanted to say, a friend of mine who who grew up in New York, a very good writer. She told me her story when she was a little kid. <coughs> so she grew up in Queens in a very rough neighborhood, had a rough life. And so she knew on the other side of New York was Australia. <coughs> and so every day she would go beside the, the highway and start digging a little hole with the hope she will actually dig a hole so she can escape Queens and go to Australia. And, <coughs> and so she was digging away every day, and, and actually then she would hear some music, and she thought she had arrived in Australia. And when she looked up, it was basically somebody walking by with a ghetto blaster. <laughs> and now I'm doing something I've never done before. People ask me a lot of times, so how does it feel when you make some of your discoveries and what you're doing? And now I'll show you what I'm doing. I'm doing this. And I think the important point is we should keep digging because one day we will find our own Australia. So thank you. The timing mechanism went down, but you were perfectly timed. Thank you so much.